Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Balkwell's Books. I'm your host, Balkwell. Uh, this is my third attempt at recording this particular episode, simply because it's been about a month since I've recorded an episode, a bit out of practice. There's no particular reason for this, just haven't felt the need to record an episode in a bit. But we're here again, and this time we're going to do it right, and we're talking about Ivan Turgenev's 1862 novel, Fathers and Sons. Now this is, of course, a Russian novel, and you might think you have an idea of what a Russian novel is. You might think of people like Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, these huge books with uh, large casts of characters and extreme personalities and much going on. This book is a, is a smaller, much smaller book, just under 200 pages, much more of the sort of French style of 19th century novel, though it does have its fair share of interesting characters. And like much Russian literature of the time period, it uh, still feels very relevant today. It still feels somewhat timely because the aspect of sort of Russian culture, Russian society that uh, makes these novels particularly interesting is the sort of social developments the extreme social changes and economic changes that are occurring at the time, which put people into very strange situations, new situations where they're not quite sure how to deal with things they've been dealing with with for a long time. Or rather, they're dealing with new things that they can't deal with the same way um, as they dealt with the old things. And Russia is sort of experiencing the birth of modernity a little bit later than the rest of Europe and struggling, you know, and so these the extreme characters of something um, uh, like a novel by Dostoevsky, um, they end up in these extreme ideological positions um, because there's a sort of lack of foundation. The government is sort of in a period of decline and they're sort of looking elsewhere and thinking well what are all these ideas about and this book is is a similar sort of idea now of course the book is called fathers and sons and so uh, we have to imagine well I don't have to imagine because I've read the book but if you haven't read the book you might have to imagine that this book deals with intergenerational uh, relationships conflicts between fathers and their sons. Now even at a time of relative stability, the relationship of fathers and sons, or really of parents and, and their children in general, is going to be fraught with misunderstandings and complications simply because of the differences in ages. I mean, usually parents are quite a bit older than their children. And one of the main uh, problems that comes with this, or the main sort of difference in their way of viewing the world, is that for a young person, the future is not real. It's imaginary, and basically anything could happen, and it's very frightening or exciting or strange. And There's this feeling that you could, that there's this sort of infinite possibilities. Whereas for the, the parents looking back, or when they view their children's future, what they're really viewing is their own past, and thus they try to make sense of it as a sort of real concrete object, because they know f fairly, um, they know to a certain extent how life tends to go. You know, they've witnessed it, and they've lived it, and uh, they can offer advice which the, uh, the child will inevitably not take most of the time. 
but usually it's probably good advice. However, in a situation when things are changing uh, as quickly as they are in uh, 19th century Russia, sometimes the parents' advice actually stops making sense uh, entirely, uh, or they just aren't prepared, you know, for this new world. It's no longer relevant to what's going on. And this leaves the, uh, the youths of the world, or of the uh, country, I suppose, in a very precarious situation where uh, they sort of feel like they have no ground to stand upon. And this is sort of what is going on in this book. So we have two principal sons in the book. Uh, the first is Yevgeny Bazarov, who is... The first is Yevgeny Bazarov, and he's sort of the main sort of focal point of this novel, even though he's not exactly the main character. He, um, his reaction to the world and his ideas are sort of the catalyst, or not really a catalyst, but they're what everyone else is sort of responding to. He has taken the most extreme, the most new position, and everyone else has to sort of deal with it as they will. And this position that he's taken is, is nihilism. So Yevgeny Bazarov basically does not believe in anything. He does not consider there to be any sort of foundational truths, uh, either physical or metaphysical or ethical, um, on which to base any sort of knowledge. So in his view of the world, um, everything has been made up. Everything that he's been told throughout his life uh, as a child, everything he's been taught, is simply things that other people made up in the past. And if they made it up, then he can make up his own stuff too. And um, basically it's all whim, it's all fantasy, in the end it's all ego. And he, you know, a lot of people when they profess nihilism, they do it, they don't carry it out to the extreme degree because they still in some ways feel constrained by the society they're in or they're still attached to certain ideas uh, that they consider important to them. Bazarov is not like that. Uh, for the most part, he really has committed himself and thrown everything out the window. And so that's his position. His friend is Arkady Kirsanov, and Kirsanov is a little bit more of a tentative nihilist. He, he's quite charmed by Bazarov, who is a very forceful personality, and, you know, the, the philosophy of nihilism is, is, can be quite uh, attractive to a, to a young person. Um, the idea of, you know, casting aside all that you've been taught as a child, um, and forging your own path in the world is quite exciting. So Kirsanov is sort of a follower of Bazarov and trying to fo follow his sort of nihilist philosophy and trying to emulate him. However, Kirsanov, he, he's still quite attached to the older ways. He's attached to his family and his father, and throughout the book, throughout the course of the book, he starts to question, you know, whether Bazarov is really the role model that, that he needs uh, in his life. If it's really fitting or, or um, you know, conducive to a good life to follow someone like Bazarov. So those are the sons. And the father's... Um, to a certain extent, a as we meet them, sort of explain, not necessarily explain the sons, but uh, give us some background into how they came to be this way. So the sort of plot of the novel is that Kirsanov and Bazarov are taking a break uh, from college. They have a, a, a vacation. And they're each going home to see their families, to visit their families for a little bit. Maybe they've graduated. I can't remember exactly. They, they might have graduated. Um, so they're taking some time to visit their families. And since they're friends, Kirsanov invites Bazarov to his, visit his family. And then later in the book, 
uh, the two of them will go visit Bazarov's family. So starting with Kirsanov's family, we have his, his father, Nikolai. And Nikolai is in an interesting position because he's trying to keep up. You know, he's a middle-aged man, but he's trying to keep up with the new ways. He's trying to read the new books, um, understand the new ideas, and sort of uh, not get left behind. And not trying to cling too hard to the ways that he's known throughout his life. He's very proud of his son, and he wants to maintain a good relationship with his son. He wants to be on an equal footing. You know, he doesn't want it to feel like his son has gone to college and sort of over overshadowed him or overcome him to the point that he no longer uh, needs him around. And he's he's not he's not a traditionalist. He's a little bit of a traditionalist, but part of what's um the tensions that Nikolai is feeling is that he has a very sort of non-traditional love life going on at the moment. So Arkady's mother, Nikolai's wife, uh, has passed away. And Nikolai has a sort of new uh, woman in his life. But she's very low class. She's um, not a, a noble woman, but she's sort of a peasant woman from the, from the nearby village. And he's fallen in love with her and wants to marry her, but he's not sure how Arkady will take it. He's not very confident in his love. He, he believes in it, but is still tentative about how society will think of him. So he's not willing to commit. So in many ways, Nikolai is sort of caught in the middle of all these changes and, and caught in the middle of, of these tensions between a sort of more traditionalist perspective and a more modern way of living. His brother, Arkady's uncle, Pavel, is more of the traditionalist. He believes strongly in fundamental truths or fundamental principles such as honor and uh, self-respect. I don't know, mostly sort of an honorable guy, and he believes in um, sort of nationalist tendencies. He doesn't like the new sort of German ideas that are taking over Russian science. And when he meets Bazarov, they immediately uh, don't hit it off. They do the opposite of, of hit it off. They, they despise each other. Partially because one of the things that Bazarov has sort of cast off with his nihilism, which I guess is a list that includes, you know, everything, but one of the things is politeness and uh, good manners. He's not afraid to speak his, his mind or declare his opinions in uh, ways that are not particularly respectful. And Pavel does not appreciate that very much. And the two are very much in conflict, uh, as you might expect, the traditionalist and the most sort of extremely modern individual possible. Now, on the other side, we have Bazarov's family. And, um, well, Arkady... Um, Arkady Kirsanov's family is moderately well off. I mean, they have uh, they have serfs, they have some land, they have a sort of an estate, and they're they're not you know super duper rich, but they're doing pretty good. Bizarro's family is, is a um, lower down on the uh, sort of totem pole, if you will. His father, Vasily, was a military doctor. And uh, importantly, Yevgeny Bazarov, the son, is studying medicine in school. And that's sort of his main um, ob uh, area of study is medicine and biology, natural philosophy, natural sciences. And the sort of conflict between Vasily and Yevgeny is that Vasily's knowledge of medicine is somewhat out of date. He still is using the older knowledge, the older forms of medicine, the older understanding um, of how to of how to help people. Whereas Yevgeny is really on the cutting edge. Uh, like I said, there's all this new medicinal and scientific knowledge coming from Germany, and that's what Yevgeny uh, knows about. And so, 
their their roles as father and son are sort of being messed up by this because traditionally the father would take on a sort of mentor role especially if the son is following in a similar or the same profession which is very common um, the father would be able to to mentor the son to help them along to give them knowledge and uh, there's the expectation that the father would be wiser and 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 more experienced which is you know maybe true but in this case Yevgeny actually has more effective and more modern um, methods of medicine and so the uh, relationship is almost reversed where it is his his father who's coming to Yevgeny Bazarov for the the new information and he sort of has to humble himself in a certain respect and he, he has to humble himself in this way but he also has to humble himself because of Yevgeny's sort of massive ego um, his belief in his own sort of higher existence his sort of uh, existence of the sort of superman and his parents almost sort of kowtow to him in a way as particularly his mother uh, who is a traditional sort of religious uh, Russian woman um, she's incredibly devoted to Yevgeny but she's also somewhat scared of him because um, they have realized that they need him more than he needs them at this point and that if they cling too much they're just going to push him further and further away and then they'll have lost him entirely so Yevgeny has sort of unlike Kirsanov um, Yevgeny Bazarov has sort of outgrown his family um, or believes he has outgrown his family and wants to live wants to have an existence or a life that it, that is better than they have that overcomes that surpasses them and this means that he doesn't really have a connection anymore to the older ways to the more traditional society like Arkady does when you don't have this connection to the past um, there's really no reason not to just fling yourself wildly and recklessly into the future which is what Bazarov is is doing and you can see how his his nihilism is almost an, a reaction to this because the knowledge that he grew up with is his the knowledge from his family the traditional values don't stack up to what he feels he's learned or what he's gathered at school in terms of sciences and then what he's gathered through his life in terms of how to effectively navigate the modern world the new uh, world that is coming in to existence and so without a foundation um, or when he finds this foundation to be inadequate he completely you know destroys it and says now I have no foundation the problem of course that comes with this is without a foundation it's very difficult to to build anything new and that anything new that you build is just as easy to collapse as anything else so it's sort of this perpetual uh, cycle there's no hope for for growth there's no hope for development or looking towards uh, a particularly better uh, future and so Bazarov is, is sort of trapped in this nihilism where it, it's hard for him to progress anywhere and uh, we see that uh, over the course of the novel and <clears throat> He, he ends up isolating himself, you know, um, with this belief that nothing really can be taught to him um, and that any relationships are only means of constraining him, an artificial means of constraining him. Things like love or family or traditional values are only sort of bringing him down. Uh, and thus, 
his, his connection to his family is lost. And as we see throughout the novel, um, Kirsanov and Bazarov end up visiting a, a, a widow named Anna Odintseva, who's sort of an open-minded, sort of modern sort of woman. And Bazarov falls in love with her. But of course, Bazarov does not believe in love because he doesn't believe in anything. And if he believes in love at all, it's only at this sort of uh, lust or an emotional uh, aberration in the mind, a form of insanity, and he doesn't want to succumb to that. He doesn't want to give up his ego to sort of live with another person or to uh, coexist with, with another person like that. And so he's, he's, he's fighting himself, he's fighting his own feelings. And um, Odintseva understands this, and even though she knows of Bizarrov's love, you know, how can she accept it from someone who is so skeptical of his own feelings for her or uh, and is so inconsistent because of his lack of principles or, or values in the sense that we would think of them? Now, Kirsanov, on the other hand, when, when he falls in love with the novel, um, he, he's much, he finds it much easier to fall in love because he has not cast everything off in quite the same way. So the sort of main sort of thrust of the novel is watching Bazarov and Kirsanov, um, understanding their family situations, and watching them react to these different pressures or these different situations that they're put in, and seeing the, the differences in their reactions based on um, how extreme they are in their in their new values, their new principles compared to the old. What's sort of interesting about this novel and the and the critical reception it received when it first was released is that an equal number of critics sort of saw it as an attack as they did a promotion of nihilism. So some people were saying, you know, Bazarov is a caricature, you're just, you know, making fun and denigrating nihilists, whereas other people saw Bazarov as a celebration of nihilism and said, well, how could you present such a um, positive view of nihilism? So obviously we can see from that reaction that clearly Turgenev was onto something and that clearly his, his representation is in some sense uh, accurate or at least not extremely biased in, in one form or the other, he is not uh, quite as didactic as people may make him out to be. Certainly um, his, his goal was to be less didactic, um, he said, than writers like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, who seem to have a much more concrete idea of what they think is the correct way of living, and that you can see uh, we talked in the War and Peace episode about the three main characters in War and Peace and how they all come to a similar understanding of what the right way of, of living life is. Um, in this book, we don't see that. We see um, it's much more of a sort of systematic novel. That's not really the right word for it. But you're basically, he's set up these characters who exist almost in different worlds, who have uh, different philosophies, and sort of allows them to interact. It allows us to see how these things, um, or how these different personalities, these different philosophies or ideologies, uh, interact with each other, and how they interact to other forces um, in the world. Each character has a different reaction. And they, they start at a different place, they react differently, they collide with each other, and that's sort of the interest interesting, um, that's what makes the book interesting, you know? So I think this is, um, quite a good book, <laughs> and if you're looking for, for a shorter introduction to Russian literature than the sort of tomes that, that people like to present, although those books are, you know, 
great, all of Dostoevsky and, and Tolstoy and Gogol and, and all these sorts of guys. Gogol's a bit earlier, but you know, they're all good things to read, but this is a nice short book. It sort of introduces you to a bit of what's going on in Russia at the time, what's going on with the Russians, and how people are responding to the changes uh, in their society the and the rapidity of these changes. And actually, an interesting complement to this book might be Dostoevsky's Demons, which eventually I'd like to make a, a full episode about. And that is a book um, about sort of socialist extremists, uh, sort of domestic terrorists in a way, well, not in a way, literally, they, they are that. And these people have taken similarly extreme uh, reactions, pol this time political reactions, to the way Russian society is structured. A lot of these people are nihilistic in extreme ways. Demons is much darker and um, sort of more sinister of a novel than this one, but they're dealing with, with similar issues, so it, it might be interesting to look at those, uh, read those together, and, and compare those two novels, and they're, they're both quite engaging reads in their own right. So that is Ivan Turgenev's Fathers and Sons, I think I accomplished my goal this time of uh, speaking about this novel in a uh, somewhat comprehensible manner. So I hope you enjoyed this program uh, of Balkwell's books, this edition, this episode of Balkwell's books. Um, if you like the show, uh, tell a friend, or post about it somewhere, or let people know about the show. You can subscribe uh, to the show as a podcast on all the podcast places that you can think of, Apple or Stitcher or Spotify or whatever, all those things. That's also on YouTube, uh, on the uh, YouTube channel Balkwell. You can check out my website, balkwell.substack.com, where I publish all the episodes of this, as well as nonfiction essays every two weeks. And aside from nonfiction, I am publishing fiction. Uh, this week I will be pus publishing my novel Only in Dreams, uh, which will be available as an ebook on Amazon and Kobo. So for more information about that, you can check out the website. That'll all be on there. Thank you for listening to the show. And as I always say, goodbye.